Yay. Welcome, my friends. We are back at long last. We are back with another Saturday afternoon live stream. We got we got the dream team. We got Tara from Spin and Prog over here. What's up, Tara? Hi. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we've been on a bit of a hiatus because Dad is not well, but he is slowly coming back. So stay tuned. I said you'd better drag him in here because he would be so cool to have in this episode in particular. But hey. We I also got Lord Murphy. He'd take up the whole stream. He'd take up the whole stream with all the gigs. <laughs> we got Mr. Lord Murphy in the house from the Garden of Delights on Deep Nuggets Radio. What's up, Lord? Hey there. Not much. Happy to be here once more. You got a show coming up tonight on the on the Deep Nuggets. I do. It's a four hour extravaganza. Right yeah, on. man. Yeah. So you're going until nine. Is that correct? Yeah. And then I'm jumping on after you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And we got Matt Brown in the house. Oh. Matt Brown. Hello. You guys know Matt. <laughs> What's happening, Matt? Nothing much. Just doing the do, living the life, you know. Good to see you guys. Yeah, it's, it's good to see you too. And you're here on the Eastern Time. You're usually on Pacific out in LA, but now yeah. you're uh, you're only 13 hours from Canada now. <laughs> As opposed to 30 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've looked at the drive. It's, it's usually, it's probably about 20 hours from Los Angeles, but... Yeah, anyway. Could be done in a day, but... Well, I'm glad that we're all here today. We I, we have some really interesting stuff to talk about. No, this is not a top 10 list or a ranking or a spin the wheel or anything that you know us for here on Brockway's Vinyl Bites. We are talking about our greatest concerts, our greatest concert experiences. For some of us, that even means playing in the band. Playing, playing in the band. Oh, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> for some of us that even means playing on the stage in the band but for some of us it also means attending the show and, and being there and all the, all the great memories that surround that surround uh you know that whole event in the evening of you know being at the show right so let's get right into it uh, i'm going to start with tara tara what is your favorite concert that you've been to and tell My us the slipknot story <laughs> oh no, not the slip now. Okay, right. I'll tell you that story. I waited when I was 15 to see Slipknot Corn and King 810. So King 810 opened up the gig. It was really good, nice heavy metal. I got to see Corn. I got thrown around the pit. Great crack. <laughs> then we were waiting for Slipknot to come on. I turn around and there is a guy in a big orange jumpsuit and the clown mask. Out, out like a light, fainted, missed Slipknot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she basically someone dressed up as Sean Cran and went out in the audience and oh. it scared the daylights out of her and she passed out. Oh, yeah. no. And she missed the oh. whole set. That was a waste of money. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I, I love corn. I would have loved to see corn. That would have been yeah, awesome. That was cool, but I really wanted to see Slipknot, and that <laughs> happened. So, I, ha yeah. I have seen I have seen people pass out at shows and miss them before, but that's usually for a totally different reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not just some guy in a clown suit, right? Yeah, no, and like that's so embarrassing. <laughs> for everyone watching the stream, hello, hello. Um, Feel free to comment and uh, tell us what your favorite concert was. Hello, Pontus. What's up, man? Hey, Pontus. Everyone, everyone, if you're watching this, you know, even during the live stream or afterwards, because we get a lot of views after, like the stream count just goes after the stream. People usually watch on demand too, right? So if you have your favorite concerts that you've been to, tell us in the comments. We want to hear from you. Lauren, what's yes, the man. best concert you've seen? And I know you've seen many. I have. That's a really tough question, though. Um, I know. <laughs> oh, you know. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Peter Gabriel has got to be up there for, mm. and well, up, literally. It was the up tour. Um, oh, lovely. I saw that twice. The first time was in uh, the December of that year and it was like in a big it was in the well the air canada center the acc in toronto or whatever oh, yeah. they call, whatever they call it now scotia bank arena now yeah, some stupid corporate brand name but anyway <laughs> yeah I know. Um, that was really amazing because he had all of you know his just his theatrics were incredible 
like he always has been like that as we know but you know you're getting inside the giant clear rubber ball and bouncing himself around and um uh anyway uh, that was pretty amazing and i saw him the following summer on the same tour at an outdoor venue at the molson amphitheater and they came out into the audience during i think it was during salisbury hill oh wow and they came out and marched all the way through and everyone's like oh my god it's peter gabriel and i was like oh my god it's tony levin <laughs> <laughs> i was the music nerd i was the music nerd in the audience tony. yeah it was, tony levin i could almost touch him um Touch that mustache. Um, <laughs> Touch that head. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> shiny, big, shiny bald head. Give it a couple of smacks like Benny Hill. Um, <laughs> that head. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Peter Gabriel, um, I think seeing Yes do Awaken was probably the ultimate moment. Yeah, it um, would be. That was, you know, I was fourth row. I was Rick, Rick Wakeman and Chris Squire were, like, right there, you know, performing this piece in front of me. That was that's got to be up there too. So I, I would say probably those two, and of course Donny Osmond. Yeah, and Donny Osmond. <laughs> All right, right on. Yeah, that's that's a great. Uh, yeah, I don't really know how we're gonna top that, but I think Matt Brown is gonna do his best. Matt, what's the best show you've seen, or what's a few of them? Tell us everything you got. Well, well I, I have to take this moment to say that this is further evidence that Lauren and I were separated at birth. <laughs> All this stuff about how we sound similar and you know, people have been kind of wondering if we're, you know, doppelgangers or whatever. Mm. <laughs> Sorry about that, Matt. No, it's totally okay. <laughs> I'm part Canadian anyway, so it just kind of figures. But um, Peter Peter was the one I was going to pick as well. Um, although, I mean, I, I saw the, the, the Up Tour and it was amazing. I've seen him a few times. But I was going to go with... the. Uh, um, the previous tour, the Secret World tour. Yeah, I had a crappy seat at the forum, and it didn't matter because they had the stage that went into the center. You know, there was the the phone the, booth, and yeah, the conveyor yeah. belt. You know, and then there was the little mini stage in the in the center with the tree and everything. And yeah, anyone who's seen the Secret World live video basically knows what it was. But that to this day that's still in my all my years of going to shows that's that's my number one i mean it was just it was incredible i mean the music the the presentation um the flow of the set i have a boot i have a boot show too so it's like you know i can kind of go oh that's right this was the order and i you know it just i mean the, the again the live video was pretty close to what it was there were only a few songs that were swapped out but that was definitely up there and um the other uh, the other band or other artist that probably falls into that same category for me is uh it's King pat metheny's group i've seen oh. them about five or six times in different configurations every Ooh. day just just shred it i mean and a lot of people associate metheny with this sort of kind of watered down smooth brazilian kind of sound and of course he's got that too but He's very, very multifaceted, and his live shows are are unbelievable. Especially when Lionel Mays was alive and he had the group together. Yeah, um, I think my favorite favorite Matheny show was I saw him five again five or six times. But my favorite one was seeing him at this little tiny venue on the campus of UC Santa Barbara for the tour from like two thousand and two, two thousand and three. Like a six hundred seat tiny place, and um, that was just unbelievable he had a he had a, a singer um an incredible uh i think it, it might have been south african singer named richard bona who also played bass and played it like a beast and he wow. came out during part of the set and they did a, a one of the old jocko matheny things bright size life and it, and they just killed it like all of a sudden the the big group became a trio you know and mm. they, that was that was a hell of a moment i'm That's jealous of the of the matheny one because we um i missed Matheny. he came to we have a big brand new like beautiful um performing arts center here in my town in burlington, burlington the b pack it's called and mm -hmm. Matheny played there and i had no idea and i was in the local record shop and he had a little flyer up in the record shop and i was like what is this he's playing 
because I mean, that's literally right down the street from me. I could walk there in four minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I said, Are you got to be kidding me. Matheny's playing there tonight. Yep. Oh, shit. So I'll call up for tickets. Sold out. Ah, uh, you're kidding me. I didn't even know. I saw no advertisements. There was nothing oh, on the internet. I was oh, like, you, how did all these other people know about it? So oh, that was a yeah. pisser. Is that, yeah, the, that's... is that the type of venue where you could go and see if anyone had any extras or was selling outside or any of that kind of stuff? I don't think I've ever seen scalpers out front. Okay. I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah, you don't even really see that now, especially because they don't have the physical tickets anymore, right? It's usually e-tickets, like through Ticketmaster oh, and stuff. Right, yeah. Like uh, when you when you go to a show in Toronto, there's still people selling shirts out front, though. <laughs> you know, forty dollars inside. It's fifty. Forty dollars. It's like okay, I'll pay the ten bucks. I don't care. You know. Right. <laughs> you guys were uh, you guys were talking about Peter Gabriel there, and I've got a peter gabriel story it's not this one is actually not from me despite the fact that i've seen him a few times but when i was in high school there was this teacher that i would talk to all the time um basically i would like just get my school work done and i would go down to the ea room and just talk to him for like an hour <laughs> because he was a musician and uh and he loved music and he loved peter gabriel and so uh, we were talking, and uh, he said, I went with my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and uh, it was, I think it was the tour for the third album or the fourth album. It was before So, but it was like he had already got established as a solo artist, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and he said, when, when we sat down, the whole place went black. It all went dark, and all of a sudden, Peter Gabriel came running out, and he was running on the backs of our seats at the venue, like... And he Whoa. like, I like, I grabbed his hand and shook his hand for a second and just said thanks for the music or whatever. And he just kind of smiled and kept running across the seats. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. I've seen him a few times. Um, I've seen him with Sting about eight years ago. Uh, he came with Sting to Toronto. They did like not a joint tour, like actually shared the same stage together. I went for Peter Gabriel and left a Sting fan, despite the fact that I already loved the Police. But it was it was really cool to see Sting play like uh, Shock the Monkey and stuff. And Peter did this really creepy version of um, that that big Sting song from the first album, from his first solo record. If you love someone, set them free. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Peter did like a really like you know how he does that kind of like whispery vocal thing. It's kind of like yeah, oh <laughs> he did that to it. It was awesome. <laughs> you know what would have been funny is if at that show where he came out and ran on the back of the seats, is if the is if you turned around and went, "Do you mind?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like push him off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't do that now. <laughs> He's uh, he doesn't do that now. He doesn't uh, ride no. bicycles upside down anymore. He doesn't go out in the big ball. But when I saw him back in September, just a few months ago. Uh, it was awesome. We had really, like, we were really close to the stage on the right side. So during, uh, I guess it was Love Can Heal from the new album, he put up this big screen in front of him. But we could still see him behind the screen. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. like, we were side stage. Like, we could see the screen, but we could see him, like, right behind it, too. And he did this thing. I don't know how the hell he did this, okay? This is magic. He waved his hand along the screen in like different motions and every time he did that well i guess i guess matt you saw the show right you saw yeah, it too I, I saw it from 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 kind of the back of the forum and yeah that was unbelievable I yeah that was, was just that part that was just him i don't know what the heck he was doing i don't know if he was holding something but he was doing something behind it with his hand and every hand gesture he would make that was what you were seeing on the other side of the screen in like red or whatever it was it was awesome it was awesome. And it was so cool. And yeah. uh, <laughs> it was so cool. Totally been, that would have totally been a Chris Farley moment. Hey, you remember when you were doing the show? Yeah. That was awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> remember, when you, remember when you were in Genesis? And, <laughs> and, then, and then you left? That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so stupid. Yeah, too funny. Too good, too good. Oh, that's but, great. Uh, 
th there was a lull. I think I told Matt this story, but uh, you know, everyone else has got to know because it, it was it was so ironic the way this happened. There was a lull in between the songs, but he wasn't saying anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was so close. Like, I was, like, eight rows back, like, directly side stage. So he was only a few feet away from me at this point. And I said, I said, uh, we love you, Peter. And he turned around, and he goes, hi there. And then Big Time starts playing. <laughs> 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 it was awesome. It was great. So uh, does anyone else have any moments? I've got more, but I'm going to tell them later. I want you guys to to say your pieces here. Does anyone have any moments where they've been like kind of close to the stage in an audience and you kind of make eye contact with someone in the band and they give you like a thumbs up or they kind of give you a wave or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Lauren. A few months ago with uh, Jay Wobble. Oh, he let's hear it, Tara. In Cork and I was right in front of him and he was playing his bass and he looked at me and went... And then went back playing his bass. And then a few <laughs> minutes later, he stopped and he was saying, oh, I'm a Leo and everyone in the band is an Aries. And I seem to get along really well with Aries people. And I was like, I'm an Aries too. And he looked at me and went, you're an Aries, are you? I was like, yeah, Mr. Wobbly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you're you're a bit temperamental. I was like, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I got to speak to Joe Wobble. That was absolutely cool. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so Aries and Leo get along pretty well, right? Is that, is oh, that... yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a Leo. <laughs> well, that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm a Leo, but yeah. I'm... There's no... So, Cody, there's no maybe about it, right? There's, there's no... <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's no There's no maybe about it for me. July 26th is prime Leo. My dad's a Leo, too, because we're born on the same day. But uh, cool. so... It, uh, Lauren, you have some cool moments like that too. I know you do. Tell us about it. Um, about being front row and well, not necessarily front row, but close enough that the band can sort of make like personal contact with you. One one of them was when I saw Marillion at um, was it the Opera House? I don't. It was somewhere in Toronto, and um, it was an incredibly hot summer day, so dangerously hot that they almost had to cancel the show like they almost weren't going to be allowed to play it was about inside the venue it was about 50 degrees celsius i don't know what that Jeez. is in Fahrenheit. yeah so what, what, it was what place was that? Which, which place yeah I, th I think it was the opera house i don't okay. remember though i don't remember it was one of those old indoor venues um and everyone was just like sweating and it was really hard to breathe and um, Ooh, not a band. I, I remember Pete Travis, you know, just sort of standing there, sort of looking like he was going to topple over. And Steve Hogar said, Are "You okay?" Like, just sort of mouthing the words to him. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah." And anyway, so there we are, and and I'm digging the show, and my wife's beside me, and we're loving it. And and S Steve Rothery goes over to his guitar amp and picks up a bottle of water, and he comes over and he points at me and throws it. And I was like, what, do I look like the hottest guy here or something, Steve? <laughs> Thanks, because I am really thirsty. So that, that was a good moment. Wow. Um, to be um, to be cared for by Steve Rothery. That's awesome. Um, there was, um, although I was fine, but I was probably sweating buckets. I always do anyway. Um, Especially in that heat, man. That's whew. Oh, it was brutal. It was brutal. And... Um, I guess another cool one would be when we saw Porcupine Tree and we were at the front. This was in a place that used to be called the Mod Club in Toronto, a very, very cool venue. Okay. And we're leaning on the stage. And uh, at towards the end of the show, my wife just, we had brought something in case we met anybody to be signed. My wife took our the CD um, liner notes from um, In Absentia. And oh. she just she just stuck it out in front of her, and Stephen Wilson looked over, and he just came over and signed it. Went back to what he was doing. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And uh, and then suddenly, you know, other people sort of cottoned on to the idea and started bringing their stuff up. And he was like, "No, no, 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 no! You can't oh. stop the show for everybody to just sign it." So I was like, "Too bad, suckers." <laughs> but <laughs> so that that was pretty cool. But yeah, there's been lots of lots of times when we were front row for. For somebody like that, I, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I bet Matt's got some cool stories too. I mean, obviously, I'm going to give a little disclaimer here about Matt. Matt played with at least three of the guys from Yes live, like in a concert. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other, that's that's a story in and of itself. <laughs> well, you're in it now, so. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I actually wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go there, but I, 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 let me, let me tell this story first. We can come, we can circle back around to that, you know, but. You knew um, I had to mention it. You knew. <laughs> I had a feeling you probably were going to. Um, but um, I'll never, ever forget, obviously. And it was like, I can't believe this is happening, but um, I was at, we have a, we have a really nice little club that's still in existence in LA called Largo, mm. where a lot of singer songwriters play and it's seen you know a handful of different people there and lo lots of times artists will go there to like you know premiere new material and stuff um in the 90s i was really into this folk duo called story who were from okay. and it was jonathan brooke and a lady named jennifer kimball they had a duo and they did like they were kind of like um I don't know. To me, they were kind of like the Indigo Girls on Hallucinogenics because their harmonies were really unusual and like dissonant and um, really beautiful, you know. And there was that kind of, you know, you know, uh, Joni Mitchell style like uh, guitar tunings and stuff. So the songs are all, you know, unusual key and stuff. Anyway, right. beautiful stuff, right? And and they had a band, but they did a tour with just the two of them, like unplugged. And they're playing at Largo. And I'm a huge fan. I've got like promo CDs and they, 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 they were there like for four shows and I went to all four, you know, they're at all at different clubs in the area. So I'm really up close doing, um, I don't even remember what song it was. Apparently I was singing underneath my breath <laughs> and I didn't know that I was doing it. Oh, I like, do that all the time. <laughs> like sometimes things are so automatic, you know, you don't even really realize you're doing it. And because their harmonies are so cool, I, I, and being a musician and being a writer, I, I, I started to write like third harmonies. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But to make matters worse, there's this weird Yabo sitting in the front row, not only singing, but singing harmonies that aren't there. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about me. Oh, like me. <laughs> right. What the hell? Anyway, after the show, I went back to, to talk to them. And um, I get something signed and I said, you know, I, I've just, you guys have really inspired me. You know, I'm a songwriter as well. And these songs have been a lot of the things I've been listening to and they've been kind of inform my own, informing my own songwriting. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. And, and Jonathan looks at me and she goes, you were singing all the harmonies that we don't have another person on stage to sing. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, well, can I, can I join? <laughs> I think it was it was embarrassing. I mean, it was really sweet and it was flattering, but it was like embarrassing because I didn't think I was singing and I didn't think I was singing loud. <laughs> well, you know, you have a good voice. I've heard you sing many <laughs> and, times. Uh, yeah, and she even wrote on on the thing, you know, you know. And the other thing, they were like, "Well, if we forget the lyrics, you know, you're right there." <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> oh, no. You should have gave me your phone number. That was the yeah, I know, right? That that was the, that was the the. <laughs> moment where I was just like all right you know what you should probably tone it down it shows a bit so, <laughs> hey you're talking to a guy that ended up in a mosh pit at an Iron Maiden show and it got so hot down there that I just took my shirt off and was like, <laughs> jumping around and rocking out with everyone else everyone else it was like the same it was the same energy from everyone like it was the same you know the whole the place was going nuts like I was jumping around having a great freaking time Bruce was throwing flamethrowers. It was too hot, and I couldn't keep a shirt on. It, you know, like three or four feet away from Bruce, it was too hot. Oh my god! Joe has seen Joe inter internetta is in the comments here, and he's seen a lot of cool shows too. Too mention too many to mention really. McCartney, I've seen McCartney too. I think most of you guys. I think Matt maybe has too. Uh, Zappa, the real Zappa. Ooh. I've seen Dweezil, but I think he's talking about Frank. <laughs> Yeah, King Crimson. Yeah, I've seen King Crimson. Bruford, uh, yeah, so he saw King Crimson like 1974. That King Crimson, I yeah. saw them with uh, with Gavin Harrison. Hi, yeah. Joe. What's I've up, Joe? I've known Joe for a long time. 
a great dude. And he's he's been into music for a long, long time. He's 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 been lucky to see a lot of really killer things that I wish I had seen too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. And he mentioned about Zappa. I've seen Dweezil Zappa. We drove out to the London Music Hall a couple about five years ago now. Oh, five years ago. Jeez, to go see him. And he was awesome. We got to meet him before the show and everything. He was just so cool. He was like, you'd think that maybe he'd have a bit more. I mean, Frank was not like a mean dude or anything like that, but he was very cynical, right? And Dweezil was not the way that you might expect him to be. I mean, not that you'd think that he was an ass or anything like that, like because Frank is not known to be a rude person either. It's just he's got like a different. He's got more like more of a sarcastic vibe, right? But Dweezil was, you know, that's not to disrespect Frank. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah. Dweezil was just so like, hey man, how you doing? Like, you want to get a picture? Sure, cool. Hey, that's cool. That's cool. I'll sign your poster. All this, like, he was so cool. He shook my hand, took some pictures. Then after the show. Um, he had this singer, her name was Sean Coey, and she did like the Terry Bozio vocals and, and like trying to grow a chin and stuff like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. She had more like a Janis Joplin sort of approach to her vocal, like that, that sexy sort of raspy type of thing that Janis used to do. And it was so cool seeing her perform. And, uh, you know, at the end of the show, cause it was just like, the London Music Hall. I mean, Lauren would know. Lauren, you've been there, right? London? No. You've not been to the London Music Hall? Oh, well, it's, no. a, it's a very small venue. And it's like they have like three or four sections of seats. And then at the end of the show, everyone just said hell with it, got up off the seats and ran to the front of the stage. It was like there was no security. Like there was nothing like there was no barriers or anything. Like it was just you could walk up to the stage and... And, and stand there and watch them play literally one foot away from you. Ooh. Like, <laughs> like yeah. So there's there's a stage, and then there's the floor, and then there's, like, seats. There, mm. You know, like most venues, they have, like, a, a barrier between the stage and, and the actual seating area. It wasn't like that. So you could walk right up to the stage and just just talk to them. Like, so that, and that's what we did at the end of the show. We talked to his singer, Sean. And we just, you know, me and uh, family friend Janet, we just, we walked right up to the stage and just chat with her while like, you know, the sh like it was like the end of the show and people were kind of leaving, but we were chatting with her. She was so cool. She was awesome. I got a picture with her. I have it somewhere. I'll post it up on Facebook or something at some point, but it was cool. It was cool. And uh, he shook my hand again. He was awesome. <laughs> they played all the hot rats. <laughs> mm. They did all the Hot Rats and then a bunch of other um, Zappa cuts like uh, Cosmic Debris and stuff like that and uh, and Trying to Grow a Chin, just like various other tracks from Zappa's catalog. But they did Hot Rats because it was the 50th anniversary of the album. Uh, now 55 years. <laughs> so you guys, so have, have, have Tara and Lauren, have you seen Dweezil also? No, yes. um, Dweezil came to Ireland when I was very young. Of course, my father got to see him uh okay. no i haven't i haven't gotten to see him those so those of you because i mean unless this was like super recent i think those of you who've seen dweezil have also seen sheila gonzalez then yeah yeah, went to, went to college and Brad murphy as well he was there yeah i went to college with her she's one oh, of yeah. my oh that's awesome she's a yeah, I saw zappa Dwe uh, well it was zappa plays zappa right yes zappa with plays yeah, I um, saw them. I don't remember what year it was now, but they were opening for Dream Theater. That's what. And, and uh, Mike Portnoy came out and sang Bobby Brown. Hamming <laughs> 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 it up. Um, but it was um, a cool show because they were doing, I think they were focusing mostly on the Roxy and Elsewhere uh, material. So, you know, cheapness yeah. and, and all that stuff. Don't you ever watch that thing? <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. <clears throat> so, all the stuff that Phil Collins heard and made sure that Gen that that Chester Thompson would bring Genesis into the fold, right? Or, or that he that they would bring him into the Genesis land. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, well, there was that famous drum part uh, from the end of uh, what is it? Uh, again, What's that song? Uh, More trouble every day. More trouble every day. Yeah. <laughs> 
end that they put into the end of Afterglow live. Yeah, pretty cool. That is cool. You know, it's funny that when you were talking about how there was no security at that show you were at, when we went to see, there was a fa a big uh, festival here in Toronto in 2003 called the, called SARS Stock, and it was to benefit um, the city who we had been just sort of shut down for a while because of the SARS virus. Oh, yeah. And, and it was uh, the Rolling Stones put it on because they love Toronto. So they were the big headline. Not anymore. It was free. <laughs> <laughs> and um and you know it was the stones and acdc and rush and the guess who and justin timberlake um, yeah uh, justin timberlake yeah <laughs> um who you know i don't like his music much but people were throwing water bottles and stuff at him it was pretty embarrassing oh but i was mad about that I was like guys like the guy comes to your to your city to play a free show to benefit your city and you're throwing shit at him mm. yeah. anyway um, but anyway, the reason I brought that up was because when we walked in, there were thousands of us just waltzing right in there. Not actually waltzing. It wasn't like three, four time or anything. I mean, we walked in. <laughs> but, <laughs> and there was no security. <laughs> yeah, so we could have waltzed, you know, because no one was going to pay any attention. Right. Yeah, there was no security. And I, we were kind of worried because there was half a million people at that show. Right. It was in a huge, you know, it was like Woodstock. And I was like, I don't know. I'm kind of nervous here. Like anyone could have brought anything in, you know, but, but anyway. But was, I've heard ACDC ruled that show. ACDC stole the show. Ooh. Yeah. I'm not like the world's biggest ACDC fan, but they really did steal the show. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I love ACDC. Yeah. And obviously that happened in 2003. I was a bit young to see them at that point. Um, I was what five, <laughs> five years old. Jesus Christ! I keep thinking oh. about what I could have seen if I had been older than five. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So I get you, man. I hear you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. You're born in what 70, 71? seventy seventy. Somebody put up a link um, on one of the Genesis pages that I'm on of a show that happened. Um, March 22nd, 1974 at Santa Monica Civic, and it was the Selling England tour. And I'm like, if I hadn't been three years old, I might have been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would, have, I would have liked to have seen Genesis first ever show in North America. Oh, yeah. But it, was, but it was the day I was born. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Was that so in? I was a newborn babe. I was literally, uh, you know, less than 24 hours old. So I wasn't allowed to go. <laughs> yeah. He could so, have held you up in front of Peter Gabriel like I know. He, he could have, he could have brought <laughs> me up on a his child. Yeah. He's, he, he was so fresh out of the oven at that point he might have melted in the heat yeah. <laughs> they, could um, brought, they could have brought you up for supper's ready and instead of the we will rock you rock you little snake just had you like at the mic yeah. like yeah. yeah, and then you know the whole audience could have been like, "Ah, you know, it would have been a great moment." But... It would have been a great moment, yes. <laughs> but I had to be in the hospital, so. God damn it! <laughs> timing, timing is everything. So was yeah. that was that in November of seventy three? It was December seventy two. Okay, because my dad saw them at Massey Hall in November of seventy three. Yeah, that's what they had come back to do a proper tour by that point. This was yeah. just them coming over. They played a show. It didn't go very well because of sound problems with the Mellotron not working because of the energy yeah. difference between the UK and Canada. And um, that's the famous show where Tony and Mike were fighting backstage before the encore. Tony <laughs> threw, threw a chair at Mike. Oh, Jesus. That's what was going on in the day I was born. This is what I brought to the world, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Almost breaking up the greatest band ever. I think they only did, they did like three shows on that little run. They played, I think, in New York and Boston or something. Yeah, it was the, yeah, the Philharmonic Hall or something. Right. It was yeah. just quick, you know, to to say, "Hey, we're Genesis and welcome." Yeah. Hello, USA or whatever, you know. Yeah, and then they they went back home, and then Phil's dad died on Christmas. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. My my first Christmas ever. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're a bit of a bad woman, aren't yeah, you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lauren, Lauren is really bringing the Garden of Delights to the Genesis camp. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Any other fun stories I can bring up for you guys? <laughs> I do have a question. Okay. Tara, have you seen anyone from Genesis before in concert? Steve Hackett. You've seen Steve Hackett when? Uh, two years ago in Manchester. So oh. that was the, the... Foxtrot at 50 tour. Oh, in Manchester. Wow. So, so was that the same place that he did the orchestra show a couple years ago? Yeah. Oh, and you didn't see that? No. Ah, oh, that's okay. Foxtrot at 50 would have been great. Foxtrot at 50 was an absolutely incredible experience. Um, yeah. You know, he, he played fur to fifth, and when he did his guitar solo in that, I felt like I was levitating in the chair. Yeah, I know. He he's that was ready, I was crying, like, and I looked over at my dad, and he was crying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everybody. So I want to want to see. The next day, we saw Uriah Heep, and it was a similar situation. There was no security or anything, and at the end of the show, I got up out of my chair and I ran up to the stage in front of Mick Box, and I put my <laughs> hands out and I went Mick, and he ran over and he grabbed my hands, and he looked at me and I said, Mick, oh my God, you're a legend. I love you, and he just kissed my hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I want to get married to Mick Box. <laughs> <laughs> we got Jeff Shilka in the house, guys. What's happening, Jeff? Hey, Jeff. He's only here for a few minutes, but let's make it worth his while. <laughs> yeah, I've seen, we're talking about Steve Hackett. I've seen him about seven times. I love him. And the most recent one is Fox Trot at 50. But you would have seen him. So, did he have Amanda Lehman with him? No. No? Oh, because sometimes when he does the UK shows, she comes out and plays guitar with him and stuff and, and sings the, um, the Shadow of the Hierophant. Mm. Oh, cool. Yeah, but he but he, she doesn't tour with him, right? So, she only does like select UK dates. But she never, she's not coming to Canada. Like she, <laughs> she's seven times. He's probably played that song five or six times. I've seen him and he always cuts out the vocal part and just comes in with the, with the, the last 10 minutes of it, the, the ending yeah. with the crazy drumming. And every time I've seen him, the drummers have been killer, especially in that section. They'd have to be to play with him. They'd have to be like. Now, this, what I'm about to say, kind of breaks my heart to say this. But uh -oh. one, the only time I ever saw a drummer make a mistake in a Steve Hackett show was Nick DiVirgilio about three years ago. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was a couple. I mean, most people wouldn't have noticed, but we would have. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it. They weren't big mistakes where the whole band just stopped playing. Like there was just subtle little nuances that were off or like a bit late or something. But I'm like, you know what? I know Nick's a great drummer because, you know, Spock's beard and and all the other great stuff. I mean, he's in Big Big Train now. That that new Big Big Train record is excellent, by the way. Like all the way through. It's great. And I think that he just kind of jumped on the tour to help out Steve because Craig had got called off to do the frost thing. And so I think he just kind of jumped in at the last minute to say, Hey, no problem. I'll help you out. I know all the stuff from, he actually played with Genesis at one point back like 25 years ago. So right. yeah, but uh, no, he was, he was a great drummer and his drum solo was really cool. He did this, uh, this cool, like a uh, call and response thing with the crowd where he would like play something like, do, 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 do. Hey, do, 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 do. Hey, hey, but there was a couple of, you mean like 2112? Yeah, that's what it sounded kind of, like. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like that, kind of like that. Cool. But um, there was a couple of little things like uh, when they came back into like when they did Supper's Ready and they came into the flower section, you know, a flower, something was off on stage. And I don't know if it was Nick or just the band, there was just a loose moment where they were kind of like a little like, late getting into that all together obviously they found their way it was like a it was like a second but i i'm very I, i'm very anal about um like when you play an instrument 
or or when you when you're a musician of some sort, it's like you you go to a show and it's like, you know, I don't know. It t sounds cocky, and I really don't mean it to, but I think Matt can attest to this, where it's like, hmm, okay, I like you. You can kind of tell if there's a mistake made, <laughs> you know, and and, it, and it, like you realize it. I don't know. Cody, <laughs> Cody, if one of those musicians heard you saying that, they'd probably knock you out. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 and and they and they do do that happens all the time on stage. Yeah, I know. it's and just the part of playing. Like, and I don't even play, and I know that. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, and and I think, I think, I don't know. It's that wasn't a slight at Nick because I'm I'm a huge Di Virgilio fan now. I, actually, Matt kind of got me into him with with the Spock's beard stuff a couple years ago, but um. You know, there was just a couple of moments here and there. I mean, I guess bands have off nights, but I guess I've just been so privileged in seeing Steve that I've never seen him have an off night. <laughs> like, but that was the, that wasn't even an off night, but that was the closest thing you could say to having an off night, if that makes sense. Like just a couple of little things that were kind of late and, you know, just a little subtle nuances that only a diehard would really notice. I don't know, man. I, I've seen a lot worse mistakes than that. They didn't yeah. even register with me, really, to be honest. But what, well, I mean, okay. musicians make about, mistakes. The thing, and, about, the thing about the mistakes and stuff, and I think my I think my my attitude about this changed just because of my own life experience, and that um, having had plenty of times on stage where things didn't go the way I thought they were going to go, it became yeah. more about I became more interested in watching how someone recovers from something like that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. That, and... be that becomes the focus in a way. Like, mm. um, well, the, f the first time I saw Matheny, it was at, um, at the, at the Wilshire Theater, which is a beautiful little place, like two, 2000 seater in LA. I love, love going to that theater. And they were, they was on the letter from home tour and they were doing one of their newer songs and the song ends with this guitar run. And um, P Pat ended, ended on a wrong note. The whole tune ended on a wrong note. Like, it was so <laughs> obviously wrong. <laughs> it was funny in a way. And so, of course, the song ends and everyone's applauding, you know. And Pat goes up to the microphone with this massive, like, shit-eating grin on his face. And he goes... I'm sorry. <laughs> I know that wasn't the right note. <laughs> I don't care. They're just they're just happy because he's a human being. That was a big yeah. life lesson for me. Actually, it was good to see that at 17 because it was like this guy is a god and he's human, and it's like okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a really, really good thing to learn as a young musician. Like it can happen to freaking anybody. It's the famous, yeah. uh, famous Miles Davis quote, you know, about um, it's not the the wrong note you play; it's the next note you play. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. absolutely. It defines what happens. What you do next really defines the deal. And so maybe it's not something happens that deviates from the version that you're used to. And it's mm. hard, like like Genesis music and and stuff of that nature, because we're all kind of used to it it's more or less scripted. We're used to it being a certain way. Mm, I let yeah. fans fuck that up and do it differently. I get off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it makes it more of a personalized experience for you as well, because yeah. you got to hear it a different way to everyone Absolutely. else. And, and not everyone else is going to get to hear it like that. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot, of, a lot of people don't like it when, when, when that happens. And I get that because it's like, it's like you're going to see a classical performance. Mm -hmm. um, but I, my, my immediate argument, and again, this is just from life experience and stuff, is that you go see two different conductors do pictures at an exhibition or a Firebird Suite or even Beethoven's Fifth, and they're going to do it differently. It's like, yeah. how did how did we interpret it? And maybe it's based on that conductor's idea. Maybe it's based on the people he's got in the orchestra. Who knows? You know, mm. but... Um, that's one of the things that makes live music live and make it come alive. I mean, yeah, it's it's sure. it, it's like yeah, it's like oh, he fucked up, but how did he get out of it? Mm -hmm. yeah. that's the part. That yeah, sure. yeah, and, and I mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to see some you know a band be really sloppy and unrehearsed or anything, but you know, a wrong note here, a wrong note there, 
is as you say is live music and it's kind of exciting in yeah. a weird way because you 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 want to witness you want to you're willing it to be held together you know and yeah. you're part of that experience you know with those musicians yeah so it's yeah a wrong note here or there is going to happen and if nick de virgilio hits a wrong note you know being as good as he is then obviously that's a testament to how complex and difficult that music is to play yeah i'm actually a bigger fan of him now than i was at the time so there's that too yeah, <laughs> yeah you know i that wasn't like to anyone watching this do not take that as a slight to nick Virgilio. i'm a huge fan i i love him and he you know it just yeah and and like you say as musicians like we notice those things but at the same time it's not necessarily a bad thing yeah it, it, because you it's like yeah like they came out of it like they figured it out in a second like like when they the band came and they were sort of disconnected coming back into the flower part of supper's ready but they figured it out like within the first two seconds and they were back on and uh you know so th there was a couple of other little things like that there was probably about i don't know maybe five or six throughout the night but at the same time i was like you know what nick just jumped in this gig to help out his friend steve yeah i mean like that's that automatically What's that? I said that automatically makes it a unique experience. The fact that he was just like, like when I saw ABWH, Tony Levin had gotten food poisoning. Oh, so he, missed, he missed the West Coast leg of that tour, and they got Jeff Berlin to come in at the last minute and do the pay per view show and the LA shows, which were right before the pay per view show, the one that was released on video. And Jeff was reading close to the edge. He had charts. <laughs> it was great. Watching this guy and he's like, he's got this massive music stand on the side, right? And 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 the other, you know, of course, you know, Bruford and Howe and Wakeman and Anderson are like, well, we wrote this. We don't need to read it. We don't need we can't yeah. even read it. you know, but he's like, he's charted it out and everything. And I'm watching him. Like that what at that Greek theater show, that was what I did. I spent a lot of my time watching Jeff. Mm -hmm. and same. He nailed it, you know, and um, and there might have been a couple of dodgy moments, but he picked right back up and got on the train. I mean, it was it was kind of cool to watch, actually. Mm, yeah, and th that would have been extra tough for him too, because Bill Bruford, the, one of the greatest drummers in the world, he doesn't play this the parts the same way twice. Yeah, he's, and he's so that more improvisatory type of attitude. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and so if you're reading something and you have Bill just going off and doing his thing, that might like you gotta really keep that sort of independence about yourself, and uh, you know you're, you're counting it out in your head. I mean, obviously you do rely on the drummer still, but you know when he's doing these um, these polyrhythmic things here and there, right? It's like <laughs> that, that's a cool thing to to uh, to sort of have to follow, and. Uh, now, I've seen Tool twice, and I've never seen Bill Bruford in concert, but my God, this is probably the closest I'll get. <laughs> Danny Carey is like, well, I mean, there's a reason they have him in the Beat Project, right? Like Adrian Ballou, Steve Vai, and I think uh, Joe Satriani, is he in that too? No. Tony, Tony Levin. Oh, Tony. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Tony Levin and Danny Carey from Tool. Now, I know that some of us here on the panel are not Tool fans, but I've seen Tool enough in concert to know that, yeah, this is, this is different music, right? But When did you get to see them? When did I get to see them? Yeah. I saw them in November of 2019 and uh, last year. Uh, last... My gosh, I'm usually good at remembering, like, exact dates. <laughs> Well, it was November 21st. It was, it was fear inoculum era, was it? Yeah, both oh, times. Nice, nice. Both times. Yeah, the first... What's that, Matt? I would have liked to have seen that tour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was great. It was great. And um, it, basically both were fear inoculum because they did the tour. They did the North American tour in 2019. 
And then two months later, three months later, the world got shut down. And so they just canceled everything and just started again. So went back all around Europe and United States and, and North America and hit all the places that they were supposed to hit before. But, uh, you know, they had only done like a little bit in the States and a little bit in Canada before they got shut down. Right. So, but yeah, they were awesome. They were awesome. And now I get to look forward to seeing Dream Theater with Mike Portnoy. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Tara, if they come to Toronto, you're flying in. I don't care where they're playing. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's I'm that's what I said. For, them. I said that for about 10 years about Genesis. I said, I don't care if they play in the freaking Antarctica. I'm going. <laughs> and I didn't have to fly because they came to Toronto. So, you know, I mean, yeah, it's it was love Toronto. Was, I it think was so I was cool. I was very lucky to have gotten to see Yes and Rush in Ireland. I'd say they were the two best gigs I've been to here. And this was Yes when Chris Squire and Alan White were still alive. Uh, yeah. Who was the singer? Uh, God, lads, I was 10 years old and they opened with Machine Messiah and I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! But it was so brilliant. Uh, it was when uh, Chris Benoit, or what's his name? David Benoit? Benoit David. Benoit, Benoit David. <laughs> ye, ye Canadians and your names. <laughs> but uh, Oliver Wakeman was there as well, and he was just incredible. Absolutely brilliant. And and getting to see Neil Peart as well when he was still alive was total honour. So they were like the only two like proper gigs I ever got to see in Ireland. And the rest I'm going to have to leave the country for. Wow. <laughs> well, been lucky, been lucky here with with Rush. You know, when you come mm -hmm. from the land of Rush, yeah, it's, pretty, it's easy to see them. I got to see them nine times over the years. But when I saw them, it was their first and only time they ever played in Ireland. <laughs> oh, did they only play there yeah. one time? Oh yeah. wow! You're lucky huh. to have been there. I got on the Rush train a little bit too late, and I'm I never got to see them. Oh god. Despite, I mean I met Getty though at a book yeah. signing. <laughs> In a lot of, cool. I mean, I don't know, maybe this is true for Lauren as well. Um, but like uh, for me, Rush even though musically they don't have that much in common, they did at the beginning. But um to me, I kind of treated Rush like they were like my Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. them so often. Um that it was like, oh, Rush is coming to town again. Yeah, let's go. You know, it was a big deal. And mm -hmm. I've been I've been into them since since I was a kid and since moving pictures had come out. But um, every time they tour, I, I, I did miss a handful of tours due to financial issues. But mm -hmm. yeah, it was always like a big deal going to see Rush because absolutely loud and really awesome. And you know, you air drumming, very loud, carring everywhere. And and then when they came back. Um, you know, out of all the times I've seen Rush, aside from the last show, because they ended they ended the R40 tour in Southern California, and I was at both both California shows. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the best show I saw them was the Vapor Trail show, mm. because I mean they played great, but it was more than that. It was we lost our band for five years, and they're back, and this is a party. You Absolutely, know? and it was like they could have gone on stage and just talked like Daffy Duck and it would have been amazing. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact, you know, they were up there killing it. And, yeah. For and sure. I, I, I totally agree. Like we, I felt the exact same way at Vapor Trails. It was an emotional show. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It really was. Um, you know, I had seen them on Test for Echo and it was their second last show of that Ooh. tour. In, in Toronto, and then they played one more day, one more show in Ottawa, and then that was the end of the tour. And then it was only six weeks later that Neil's daughter was killed. Oh, Jesus. And so for five years, I spent five years thinking that I saw the second last Rush show ever mm. and was never going to see them again. And I, you know, that was pretty crushing, really. Yeah. And when they came back, like, wow. Music music really is therapy. And I, I find that, like, you know, 
as much as we make fun of like certain bands like Kiss and stuff who are always doing another oh farewell tour, farewell tour, or a reunion, this and that. You know what? I mean, it it's one of those things where again, Matt, as a musician, you can attest to this. It's so therapeutic to be playing music and listening to music. And so I can see why, like you remember when Phil Collins went into retirement. Like if you read his book, he went into the worst decade of his life. After yeah. after that final Genesis tour, oh yeah, like, and he went through the ringer, man, like it, like really badly. And so, like when he decided to come out and start doing the solo tour again, like in 2018, I didn't care that he was sitting down. I mean, the fact that he's out there and he's lifting people up, and you know, being in, I'm getting chills talking about this. Oh, <laughs> being in the crowd and hearing him sing "Take Me Home" and have. 20,000 people around me singing that that really anthemic chorus that's got to do something for the performer man that's therapy right there that and it didn't cost him anything <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's if it's in your blood like that and i think for a lot of a lot of artists whether they're artists or entertainers it's in yeah. their blood they have to do it. it's not just about the paycheck or it's not just about the artistic um sense of satisfaction it's just in their dna they have to do it mm, and yeah. by by whatever means necessary they're, they're going to do it until their body says they can't so mm, yeah. i get it you know and yeah me too it's equally yeah, it's, it's equally therapeutic for audience and for a performer i mean um and that's another reason why i i don't you know maybe when i was younger we are kind of divided off into factions and like oh were you into this or into that but the older I get, like to me, the whole idea of guilty pleasure is bullshit. I don't yeah. believe it. Yeah. I just don't believe it. Like, why, why would like, I feel guilty about liking something? Yeah. That's you know, crazy. it's it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And the fact is, you know, music, no matter how intellectual you are, no matter how much you have studied or whatever, music is experiential. It's about yeah. how it hits you. Yes. If it hits you in your brain or in, in your stomach or in your groin or in your heart, it doesn't <laughs> where it hits. And, and that's not going to happen the same way for two pe two different people. So, no. you know, if, you know, we we all like artists that, that someone else on the panel isn't all that crazy about. But yeah. I'm never going to be like, oh, you know, because it brings you to and that's important. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's linked to so many uh, memories. Yeah. too you know it's very important when you hear music and yeah. you know when you were 17 and you and you heard that song that you just couldn't stop listening to you're never going to forget it and you're never going to unlink it from that memory mm -hmm. and so it's going to have a very positive um, yeah. reinforcement for you when you, when you hear mean, it, think about it i've heard yes to you and you and i have pretty much turned into a little a, a little like puddle on the floor because it reminds me of so many things in my life including yeah. First time I heard that track when I was probably 15 or 15 years old. Mm -hmm. All these memories attached. And and every time you like every time you hear something again, you kind of like you're kind of creating a new memory. So you're building on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like scenes from a memory, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I have a, for those of us that are that are uh, this into music, and this is something that people who consider music a sort of secondary background thing don't always grasp is that the emotional um, attachment that you form with music can be the music itself and not the lyrics. Yeah. I yeah. can be very moved by a stirring piece of music, Beethoven's seventh. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I get Beethoven's it. Beethoven's seventh second part. Um, and that has no words and i can be very moved by uh you know the way peter gabriel sings something and it doesn't matter what those words are yeah sometimes i don't even bother reading along with the lyrics because i don't really care what they are <laughs> sometimes lyrics are great you know yeah. ian anderson is an amazing lyricist neil peart was an amazing lyricist but music i think is what really i form the attachment with yeah I'm yeah, not really sure how I got on that tangent, but no, and I, I have something to add to it actually. So I'm glad you did, because 
a couple of weeks ago. This was just as I was coming out of my my illness that I was pretty sick for a while there at the beginning of the month. And um, I was laying in my room and I was listening to um, New Language by Yes. And this just shows you, Tara knows the story. This is very embarrassing, but I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it anyway. Not embarrassing. We all have moments like that, so work away. Well, I know you do, and I and I know that Matt and Lauren do, so I'm comfortable mentioning it here. But um, that was the album when I was born. That was the new Yes album. Was the latter right? And my dad was playing it over and over and over again like just for years, like, and then magnification came out and then it was the two of them. Right. And he would just was like, he was it's like, I'm giving this kid as much yes and Beatles as I possibly can. <laughs> but, uh, so I was laying there and I hadn't seen him for about well over a week at this point. Right. I mean, and again, he is alive and well, he lives up the street, but I was just so sick that I was kind of, you know, I was, I'm not going to, you know, go out and get him sick, right? Like, that's just not going to happen. But I was, I hadn't seen him in a week, so I was missing him. And I put on that song, and I don't know what, I, it hit me about halfway through, and I just started bawling my eyes out. Just, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't even know why I'm sad. <laughs> like, I miss my dad. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, honestly, that that that's it. And you know, like it's not even a sad song for God's sake. Like yeah. it's that's but a happy that, that album is a very uh uh moving album in a very happy way, like it can kind of lift you up and, and bring tears of joy to your eyes, I find. Well, that was the first time I ever did that to that song. And I've listened to it again since, and it's like the same usual feels good to listen to, but that time listening to it then really just it, it made me think of being a kid and hanging out with my parents and I mean heck, I still hang out with my parents but it just made me go back like 20 years in my in my head and just thinking about listening to that and dancing around my dad's studio listening to that song mm -hmm. and like that song in particular so that's, before that's I get what I mean again, <laughs> that's what I mean about about you know when you say it's not even a sad song. It doesn't have to be, you know? I know. It just has to be what, why that song is meaningful to you or that piece of music is meaningful to you. And that's why it's such a strong attachment. Yeah. And I whimper at Carrie Underwood songs sometimes, okay? So you know what? Well, me too, but not for the same reason that you do. <laughs> no, no, it, it just... Right. It, doesn't get, those... it doesn't get any as you get older. Like, it... it if anything, it becomes more of an emotional attachment. And yeah. I'm totally okay with that. I got oh, no yeah. Problem. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I am just I was just sitting there on the bed, like, just, you know, t tears and t tears pouring down. It's like, oh, man. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not even, I wasn't sad before this, you know, but it just, it makes you, it puts you in a different headspace when you hear those songs that you grew up with and you think back to a certain time and it's like, this person is still, you know, obviously, like, I'm going to be better in a few days. I can just go hang out with them. But the point is, it's like it's that reminiscent, right? It's that reminiscing thing. And while we're talking about Yes, uh, Tara, you said that you saw Yes when you were 10 years old with Benoit David, right? Yeah. Well, that was 2009, correct? Yeah. So the first time I saw Yes, I was 10 years old in 2008 with Benoit David at yeah. Hamilton Place Theater. <laughs> It was, I think it was the same tour. Well, they didn't open with um, with Machine Messiah, but they added, they had it at the end of the set. I don't remember it that well. I do a little bit. I remember, like, we went to the washroom and hearing them start close to the edge. <laughs> I, I bumped into Alan White the next day in Dublin. And what? I, I, like, physically hit off him by accident. <laughs> And I remember just looking up and seeing his face, and I just turned to my dad. I was like, <laughs> and he was like, "No, no, no, we won't disturb him now." He's he was with his wife, like, and they looked like they were shopping together or something. But that's my claim to fame. I touched Alan White. <laughs> Whoa, Tara! That sounds like it's uh... <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, now Matt needs to tell us the yes story. You're not okay. getting out of this one without telling us. All Yay. right, all right, all right. Um, I, I think this is the one you're talking about. I mean, I've I've been a yes man forever, and I've had a lot of 
interactions with the guys, mostly in like meet and greets and stuff. But um, this isn't, that's not what Cody's talking about. The, the in, Taylor uh, Hawkins one. Yes. In, in 2012. Well, it needs a little bit of backstory because um, in, in 2008, 2009 or so, um, I think that's how long ago it was. Um, I was rehearsing with my Genesis tribute and um, we were down a bass player. So like I'm trying to cover bass parts with my left hand on, on the Hammond. Oh, so Rayman Eric. Get through the sh get through the rehearsal, right? And we're playing Squonk and in walks Billy Sherwood and Jimmy Hahn because they were rehearsing in the big room down, down the hall. And they were like, wow, this band's playing Genesis. And so we all met them, you know, dur during the time when Billy had started to do Circa. And um, so we just ended up kind of getting connected in a strange sort of way. And that eventually led to us opening for Circa. And then I ended up playing with Billy for a little while, um, just on a, on a project that didn't come to fruition, but we rehearsed for a few months. That band featured Tony Kay and Jay Shellen and Jimmy Hahn and Bill wow. Bobby Kimball, Bobby Kimball from Toto. And it was going to be a show where we did Yes songs and Toto songs and a couple of circus songs. Um, that became a thing called Yo So. But um, that must have stuck in Billy's mind because a couple of years later, I get a phone call at work and it's Billy and he's like, Matt, you're going to get a call from Chris Squire. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Could you imagine? Like, oh my god! Pulling my leg here, I was like, "No, no." Chris wants to put together a band for this this event, and I recommended you to play keys. And I was like, "Wow, dude, thank you." Mm -hmm. And I thought, it, yeah. I thought initially that Billy was going to be on the show too, but I think he ended up having some other stuff come up. I obviously he had a conflict. So, sure enough, a day or two later, I get a call from Chris. I still think I'm being punked, you know. Um, <laughs> Like this is well, I possible. think I'd, I'd just pass away if I answered the phone. Like, no, right. like, hey, this is Chris Blair. <laughs> my ex-wife and, ex and I never deleted that message because it was just so surreal. Um, anyway, you didn't, you didn't delete the message. You still have it. Well, I don't have the answering machine anymore. But oh, oh shit! But it, it went with the answering machine. Um, so what ended up happening was um, we ended up doing a show that to honor Chris, every year Bass Player Magazine would do this thing where they pick different bass players to feature. And that year it was Chris and I think um, Family McBarrett from Whalers and, and a couple other people. And um, so it meant that you needed to play like a set of, of music, 20, 25 minutes. And the lineup on stage ended up being myself and Claudio Pesavento on keys. And Claudio had worked with Chris and I think he'd played with Dio and a couple other people yeah. on the um, Taylor Hawkins on drums. Yeah. My good friend Johnny Bruins on guitar, who is now in a band called Total Master Tain, but he's he and I played in a Yes tribute back in the 2000s called Roundabout, where John Davison had been, and that's where John got pulled to go be in Yes. Oh, yeah. I forgot that you guys were in that band together. We played together for about nine months. Um, so it was John, Johnny, myself, Chris, Taylor, and Claudio. And we did a five song set. It was like, hold out your hand, you by my side, seeing all good people, owner and roundabout. And it was a <laughs> little tiny yeah. video of it up on YouTube. Um, it's a little tiny club um, in Los Angeles. And uh, someone took a still shot of, of, the, of the six of us on stage bow you know and i'm like this schlub in a miles davis t-shirt like why am i up here with these guys but it was amazing and, and a good friend of mine who works in the industry he said to me um the next time you have a shitty day go look at that photograph mm -hmm. yeah you yeah. were on that stage for a reason yeah, yeah honestly exactly. i'm grateful beyond beyond measure that yeah actually. that's awesome if it only happens once fuck it happened you know yeah and, yeah everyone yeah. was grateful for that and um and they were the nicest guys you know to taylor was geeking out because taylor hawkins was a huge genesis fan and like he and i spent the entire time when we weren't playing 
talking about queen life killers and seconds out because <laughs> yeah. he was so into those records you know they were like you know and he was like i'm just this guy that plays butt rock and we're playing prog and this is great you know he was he was <laughs> but so happy oh. such a shame what happened to him because he was such a yeah. bright bright oh. light yeah. yeah yeah that's that's a that's a sad story i remember I remember when it happened. I remember. Yeah. I, I remember. I just remember I was sitting in my old house and I was actually listening to, I was listening to Meatloaf. <laughs> I just, I was just in the mood for that. I had the Bad at a Hell record going and uh, it was at the end of, um, it was at the end of Paradise by the Dashboard Light just going into For Crying Out Loud. My memory is very vivid. I will never forget these things because my friend texted me just at the end of just before for crying out loud came on. And my friend texted me, said, Did you hear about Taylor Hawkins? And when I hear when I get messages like that, I immediately go Google it because I know that there's hoaxes out there, right? It was the same thing when Neil Peart died. I was like, mm. Don't fucking lie to me. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> right. But uh my my friend texted me. He's like, "No, Taylor Hawkins passed away." And I looked it up, and I was like, "He's like 50. It's like, oh my gosh!" I laid on the floor while this meatloaf record just finished, and I was just I was literally frozen because I had just become a big Foo Fighters fan at this point. I had just got all their albums. Like I was just like I was actually planning on going to go see them. I was too. <laughs> yeah, I was like they were they were gonna hit up July, they were gonna hit up Toronto in July and my now ex girlfriend and I were thinking like, oh maybe we'll get tickets, maybe we'll go on the floor or something and just party with Dave and the boys, right? Well that didn't happen. And um yeah, I just remember being totally at a loss for words, like just to the fact that he was gone, you know, and it's like, Well, how is the Foo Fighters even gonna carry on? Because he was such a big part of their show, you know. Yeah. Like that 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 dialogue between Dave and Taylor throughout the whole show. I mean, Dave, as, as far as like, if you look at the concert footage of Foo Fighters with Taylor and the band, I don't even think they talk to the other guys on stage. They just talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, it's always like my man Taylor's going to come out and sing a Queen tune and things like that, and then you know, Taylor Hawkins is going to do this, and you know maybe it's that drummer connection between the two of them, right? But, like, you know, Taylor would come out and sing songs. And, like, I mean, I, th I think once in a while, Dave would be like, here's Pat Smear on guitar, right? That type of thing. But for the most part, the connection was between Dave and Taylor. And, um, you know, I was like, well, how is that even going to happen now? I mean, obviously, they found a way because now they're continuing on with, uh, I think it's what, Josh Holmes, that guy? Yeah. Yeah, he's from Queens of the Stone Age, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're continuing on with him, and he's a great drummer. But uh, it'll, it's, it'll be, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how the how the dynamic will be now going forward, right? The new the new album is really good. Yeah. Oh, but very sad, very sad. That's but we don't want to end this on a sad note, man. Oh, no, no, <laughs> we're not ending this on a sad note. <laughs> the next concert I'm going to see as of now. Is in May and it is Mr. Big with Nick D. Virgilio on drums filling in for the late great Pat Torpy. I hope he doesn't make a mistake. Yeah, yeah, Cody will be watching out now. <laughs> Man, you know I what? had to. I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> you know what? I I didn't fault him for that. I just remember that as a gig because I remember Gary O'Toole and things. Craig Wendell were not. I didn't really hear them make any mistakes, but that wasn't. <laughs> Oh, I had to. I'm sorry. No, that was great. <laughs> it was great. It was oh great. God. Honestly, how'd you do? That was great. There was that was not a slight at Nick Di Virgilio in oh, any way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm here. I can't stop laughing. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> that was just I. I just remember the looseness of the band coming in and, and the flower section and just being like, oh gosh, you know. When, when, uh, when, Time later, you gotta. We, we won't do it now, but you guys gotta remind me. I have a, I have a funny, I have a funny dancing, dancing with the moonlit night story, of a, a, a it was a, a gabble, a, a gabble near train wreck that was really, really. Fun. We can save it for a different thing. We're talking about the next show. But. I mean, 
I, I guess if it had just been like two or three little mistakes, then it would have been like, okay, you know, I mean, it's hey, still it was passable, but I mean, it was like five or six of those little mistakes. You and... know, one, one day you're going to meet Nick and he's going to go, dude. <laughs> I saw your YouTube show. He's just going to slap you. <laughs> well, he's playing with Mr. Big and um, I know he can handle it. I mean, Mr. Big is probably a little bit more on the metal side in some cases, but uh, you know, I mean, Nick, you know, he's doing the big, big train thing, big, big train thing on the record that I just actually sent Tara. <laughs> Hold it up. You got it. Let's show the people. It's in the front room because I was listening to it. But uh, oh. yeah, it's, it's my birthday on Monday and Cody sent me a birthday present. Oh. Happy early birthday. Hey. Yes, yes. Yeah, she uh, she needed the new Big Big Train record. And, uh, you know, I was like, yeah, you got to have this. So happy <laughs> birthday. Um, but his drumming on that is absolutely fantastic. And, and I mean, the same with, you know, the Spock's beard, you know, that V record. And his yep. singing too on uh, on the Feel Euphoria and those albums and stuff. And so I'm like, hey, you know what? Yeah, What's that, Matt? He's got a great singing voice. He yeah. does, and he's a, he's an excellent drummer too. I mean, obviously everyone has their off nights, you know. I mean, I mean, it wasn't just him that was off coming into the flower part. It was everyone. <laughs> I interviewed him, was... and he was very very cool. He was very cool yeah. to interview. Nice. Yeah. It just shows to Goya that it's a that it's a live show, you know. It's it's no Motley Crue type bullshit about you know, you know everything being on tapes and all that. It's you know they're they're a real live band, and Nick was actually playing live. You know, that's incredible. We didn't talk about our worst show. Oh. Yeah, let's let's talk about the worst show. <laughs> you want to save that for another time, or you want to go? I I talked about mine, which was the Slipknot one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that was your fault. Lord, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was the clown's fault. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited for Mr. Big, though. I mean, I know Nick is gonna kill it, and obviously, I've been I've been waiting to see Mr. Big for my whole life. <laughs> they haven't been to Toronto since '92, nice. and it's been 32 years. And so to see to see Billy Sheen and Paul Gilbert going at it on stage, I mean, if you guys. Obviously, I know you guys have been following um, the Brockway's Vinyl Bites on Deep Nuggets Radio. The first song I ever played was Daddy, Brother, Lover, Little Boy from the Lean Into It record. First song. I knew I knew when I go on air, the one, one of the first two tracks I was going to play was either Funeral for a Friend from Elton John or that track from the Lean Into It album, and I played both of them in the first set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So let's talk about, let's, uh, we're going to wrap it up in a little while, but we're going to talk about our worst shows that we've ever seen. Mm. So Tara, you, are, you, are you confident that the Slipknot one was yours? Yeah, I mean, I've never actually seen a bad performance. But yeah, yeah. to be honest, I mean, everyone I've gotten to see was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Worst yeah. show was Neil Young with the International Harvesters. Yeah, I I don't doubt that. Um, I've heard he he has a habit of uh, being mean to the audience and playing everything that they don't want him to play. Yeah, which is most of it for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no I I I'm not being disrespectful to Neil. I guess I just know people who like. I don't know. I just there's so much other great talent that I like a lot, but I love his Gold Rush record and the Deja Vu stuff. But yeah, like what you just said about him, you know, playing stuff intentionally that he knows the audience does not want to hear. That is just not, you know. I mean, I get it. Play your new stuff, but you know, at the same time, play good stuff too. Like play the Gold Rush album. You know, play Helpless. Play Harvest. You know, stuff that got you there. <laughs> So Matt, what was the worst show you've ever seen? Well, I mean, the worst show can still be good, just the least good. Um, I saw Motley Crue on the Theater of Pain tour when I was fourteen, <laughs> and it was visually exciting, but the music was awful. <laughs> <laughs> when I say visually exciting, I'm talking about the audience. It was yeah. the craziest audience I'd ever been in in my life, and um, Vince was just plastered and 
was forgetting lyrics and but then I kind of got the feeling that that's how crew shows often were anyway so I was like okay well maybe this is just par for the course but it still are yeah yeah mm. I mean I you know they're I, I still like their first two records when I oh was, yeah but yeah that was a big big disappointment and actually the other one was I actually walked out of the yes show once which I don't really want to talk about but um Ooh. they were having a really terrible I didn't <laughs> my last memory of them so I left that's surprising I know right that happened. Mm. But, well hey well here's Matt I, I, I'm complaining about subtle little mistakes in a Steve Hackett show and here's Matt walking out of yes <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Matt should be the Matt's the one in the corner now. <laughs> uh -oh. I'll, go, I'll, no. I'll just sit over there, you know. My dad saw the Rolling Stones in 1972, and uh, and Stevie Wonder opened for them, and he said that Stevie Wonder was possibly the best show that he had ever seen up to that point. And the Stones came on, and he said he left two songs in because he couldn't hear a damn word that they were saying because it was just so like it took him. It took him to the third song to realize that the second song was Jumpin' Jack Flash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's what he said. <clears throat> the worst show I've ever seen was it was tied with one of the best shows I've ever seen because it was an opening act and it was effing terrible. The headliner was great because the headliner was Tool. Okay. But the opening show was the first time I saw Tool was Killing Joke, and they weren't horrible, but they weren't great. And that, for a while, I was going to say, um, <laughs> Ian says, I saw Stevie, but he didn't see me. <laughs> Don't let him drive you to the to the, anywhere. Right. So the first time I saw Tool was Killing Joke, and... Uh, they were kind of, you know, e. It was, it was okay. But then Tool came on and made you forget about it. Second time, second time I saw Tool, the opening guy was the idea was really cool for what he was doing. And I know some friends who went to the show as well and thought he was amazing. So I'm sorry to those people, but it was so hard to listen to. I almost had to leave the venue because the volume was so bad that this guy, he was a one man band. He was playing guitar and drumming and singing at the same time. It was a really cool idea. Even hats off to the guy for doing it, okay? So obviously, like like I say, like no disrespect, but the execution was so horrible. The sound of the kick drum actually made me feel like I might be sick. Like, I, like it was so overbearingly loud and abrasive and aggressive and not in a cool way that you know I love with my metal music. Mm -hmm. This was... This was aggressive in in the most dirty way. And the, again, the sound of the kick was so overbearing that it was like, I might actually have to leave the room. I might actually have to go outside and come back. When, But when Tool came on, again, it was like, I think they do this intentionally because they have like some really, something that's really not very good open for them. And then they come on. And so it makes them look even better. <laughs> you know, but they don't need it. You know, they don't even need the opening act. Like, like we're there to see Tool, right? I mean, except for when they, you know, do a double bill with Primus or anything like that, which they've done before. But when Tool comes on and they come out with something like, I don't know, what was the first song they played? It was, I think it was something from the new record, but. You know, then they start playing stuff like, you know, The Grudge and and then the Fear Inoculum title track. That's what they opened with, was the title track for Fear Inoculum. And they bust into their catalog. They start doing older tunes like Intolerance and then a heavy dose of the new record. It's like, man, huh. <laughs> I don't even remember life before this, you know, like let alone an opening act. I don't even remember living and breathing before Danny Carey came out on stage and started playing the way he is. But uh, yeah, so that that's my worst because I've never actually been to a been to a, a shit show, as they would say. I've never seen a bad show. It's 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 all been good, except for that one guy that made me want to throw up. <laughs> who was he? Like, who were the band? I think it was something Beans. It was um, it was 
the cool beans or something like that. I forget what it was, yeah, but it was just him. I think there was maybe one other guy on stage, but it was mainly him doing, he was playing guitar and drumming and singing. And the, Oh, it was so out of time. And all of this, it was just like, it was the, I, the idea was cool. The execution was not cool. Then again, I probably couldn't have done it as good as he did because that's a lot going on at that one time. But that picture, Oh, <laughs> and the snare was so piercing. It was just, everything was so aggressive about it. It's like, you don't need to do that. Just, <laughs> just be good. That's all you have to do. Don't, don't tell <laughs> us like, Lauren, to close us out, do you have a, a bad concert that you've seen? Um, or great? Well, I have two for different reasons. The worst one I saw as far as the performance goes was, I don't know if you know John Wesley. He's um, played with Porcupine Tree as a sort of second guitarist and singer. And he, uh, he opened for once for Marillion, and it was just him with like a sort of loop, like a backing tape, just him sort of playing along to loop. And it was just really bad, really bad sound. I didn't like the songs, and nobody seemed to like it. It was really, really dull. And it kind of brought down the energy level that you need from an opening act. You know, you expect them to pump the crowd up a bit, you know, and get them excited for the main act. And this was just like right. sucked yeah. all the energy out of the room. But the other one, my worst experience at a show was um, when I went to see the first, the very first Lollapalooza festival which was um, Jane's Addiction and Susie and the Banshees and Nine Inch Nails and Living Color. and Was Tool there too? No, Tool didn't exist at this point. Oh, okay, because they did it in 93, but I don't know. And uh, Ice-T and uh, Rollins Band. And, anyway. Cool. All the bands were great, uh, but I decided to, this is the middle of the summer, I decided to wear my cut off misfits sweatshirt oh. um, <laughs> and no sunblock of any kind oh, uh -oh. God. i got the single worst sunburn known to man in history oh my god it was absolutely brutal and by the end of the night i was feeling sick already oh you had a sun stroke <laughs> yeah yeah it was terrible God, that, was, really that was by the time Jane's Addiction came on. I was just like woozy and and I was young Jeez. too, you know. So stupid, yeah. stupid mistake. Yeah, I, I never done that. <laughs> don't don't do that. I'm not wearing a sweater to a show in the middle of summertime. <laughs> yeah, well, this yeah, a cut off sweatshirt. I know, really <laughs> stupid. <laughs> but the funny thing about that show is that along with that misfit shirt, I was wearing. A pair of pants that had that were turquoise with pink flamingo print. All over <laughs> them. Okay, so I bought these at this weird joke store at the mall. This is what I decided to dress myself in and go out in public to an all-day show. Wow. I was like 19, I think, or 18. And um, but while we were watching the opening band, which was Henry Rollins, um, Ice T came out to watch the band and he came out on a little power scooter and drove up and stood right beside me because we were right at the side by the gate side gate and he turned and looked at me and i was looking at him and i was like holy shit it's iced tea and he looked at me and he said dig the pants <laughs> <laughs> thanks nice thanks yeah. Yeah. i was like i That's wonder hilarious. if that wasn't actually a compliment i'm not sure no but... i think i think <laughs> I don't think he was taking the piss. I think he's. No. Yeah, you think he liked them? I hope so. Taking, taking the piss. Oh, we've been hanging out with these uh, Irish and British people too much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to say what my best concert was. Give me one second. Can I have a... For a long time, it was Roger Waters, because I've seen Roger Waters numerous times. Yeah. And for a long time, then after that, it was Tool. But then I drove out to Montreal last summer. And saw Metallica twice on the Metallica weekend. Both shows. And it was just, I mean, even though I went with my ex-girlfriend, still looking back at the whole experience and meeting the people that I'm, I'm still friends with now. I'm, we met people at the venue that I, like, you know, 
literally drove down from Chelmsford, Ontario, just to uh, go to Niagara Falls, and they stopped by and, and saw me on the way, like two, like about a, uh, four weeks ago, I guess. And uh, we just the whole experience of, of seeing this band live and catching their energy and becoming friends with pretty much everyone in our row was mm -hmm. awesome. And and then you know going back and doing it in a, a second night, you know, like meeting them and, and gelling with them like for real on the first night, and then it's like you guys coming back on Sunday? Yes, yeah, oh awesome, see you again. And it's gonna <laughs> like it was just it was so awesome, and I wish that everyone could have seen it. It was so great. And they played um, Leper Messiah. <laughs> no one expected that. Nobody. When they came in with that, I was like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the opening acts were great, too. I mean, Pantera, Five Finger Death Punch, Ice Nine Kills, Mammoth, Wolfgang Van Halen. Those were all the opening bands over the two nights. And cool. they were great. Everybody was awesome. And people say, oh, the sound at the Big O in Montreal is is kind of shite. And, well, you know, um, it's kind of true. But when Metallica came on, it was just, you know, the, the sound was on point. Everything was great. I mean, we even got in with the, sec with, with the security guard. The first night she saw how, how much we were rocking out and enjoying the show. And one of my uh, newfound friends, Chantel, if you're watching this, hi, Chantel. Uh, she said to the security guard uh, near the end of the second show, she said, do you mind if me and my me and my friends here just go down to the front row just for one song? And the security guard says, well, I can't really let you do that. She's like, come on, please, please. And she's like, well, I gotten to know you guys a little bit from the first night. And so, OK, I'll let you come down to the front. So we went back to the front. <laughs> we watched them play one, almost the whole song. She said one song. She totally broke the rule. She could she could lose her job potentially for doing that. And so the fact that she did that because she saw how big of Metallica fans we were, big props to that security guard. That was cool. And, you know, just getting to be able to go down to the front and head bang, you know, right beside the mosh pit. It was so cool. <laughs> Montreal is a great place to see concerts. I've seen some amazing shows there because all the prog bands go there. And uh, the metal bands too. Yeah. I saw IQ there, oh, you know, Marillion right. Weekend, um, you know, Mystery, uh, Gong. I saw Gong there in 96, you know, wow. um, Steve Hillage, like, oh, amazing, amazing nice. bands to go there. <laughs> yeah, Montreal's a, a great city. That's, if you do ever come to Canada, Tara, that's where you need to go, Montreal. Okay, right. Sorry, Toronto, Cody, I want Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto's boring, yeah. trust me. I wouldn't mind, but if you're only coming down for a week, that might be a lot to jam pack in there. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we, much, like, we booked hearts. tickets today for um, Nick Mason and Saucer Full of Secrets, so we're oh, heading over to Manchester in June for that. Cool. Woo! You're going to love that show. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. I've I'll seen that show, too, and it's awesome. It's oh. very good. We were, it, it's actually at the same place that we're going to see Mr. Big next month. Cool. And uh, we were in the 10th row. And there was some guy that looked like Jerry Garcia behind us that was just running up and down the um, little uh, alley thing, little uh, pathway behind us. And he was just dancing. Like... <laughs> he almost got kicked out because he went up to the stage when we saw Nick Mason about five years ago. This dude almost got kicked out from the security. Yeah, there was security at this one. <laughs> and uh, he almost got kicked out because he went up to the stage. Because, again, this the Meridian Hall, as Lauren would know, you can walk right up to the stage, but there is security that stands on either side. Um, and he just flopped over the stage, like, right on the stage, right in front of, like, Guy Pratt and all these Pink Floyd dudes, right? <laughs> it's like, man. Gosh. Get out of here. <laughs> That's going to be a great show, Tara. And you know what else is going to be a great show? The show that Mr. Lauren Murphy is putting on www.deepnuggets.com tonight. The Garden of Delights at 5 o'clock Eastern, 2 p.m. if you're on the Pacific. He's going about generally about four hours. And then I'm coming on after him to uh, take you right through to midnight. So it's going to be a great night of music. So don't forget to check that out. You really got to hear it. 
yeah, I guess we're uh, I guess we're closing it up now. It's been a great conversation, though. Yeah, it's and fun. Mr. Yeah. Matt Brown, all the best with your gig tonight in Georgia, Atlanta. Thank you. Thank you. You're out there in hot Atlanta, right? According to the uh, Almond Brothers. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well i want to say a big thank you guys um over the last three weeks again once i got sick and you know in now i'm recovered but it's just been so busy that i haven't really had the time to do a saturday stream and so i'm glad to see that we're back on it now hopefully we'll be able to aim for something next saturday too and uh and get the ball rolling again and so yeah, because the train nearly fell off the track, but it's it's not going to go that far off the track when it's us here. You know what I'm saying? We're we're back in business and we're ready to rock. So thank you guys for watching this currently and on demand afterwards. Much love to all of you. Thank you guys on the panel, and I know Matt's got a gig to go prepare for, so we better go let him do that. We're gonna we're gonna let him out of jail. We're gonna open up the lock, and uh... <laughs> the end is nigh. Oh. <laughs> The end is always a new beginning. You know, we're, we're never far away. We're always coming back with something cool and new here on Brockway's Vinyl Bites. So thanks to Lauren. Thanks to Matt. Thank you, my wonderful friends. Thank you to my lovely Irish friend, Tara. And uh, we'll, we'll chat, and uh, we'll be back. We'll be back next Saturday, I'm sure. So peace out from all of us here. And don't forget to rock on. Rock on. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>